All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the National Constitution Center. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tom Donnelly. I'm our Senior Fellow for Constitutional Studies here, and I'm absolutely delighted uh, uh, to join you this afternoon uh, to welcome back uh, uh, prize-winning historian, great friend of the center, Carol Birkin. Um, you know, her book here, A Sovereign People, I can't recommend, recommend it more highly. What's, what's, what's so really amazing about it is it features so many of the founders that we care deeply about. You have George Washington, John Adams, Alexander Hamilton, Madison, Jefferson, they're all in here, but we fast forward past the point of the revolution and the Constitutional Convention, and instead, uh, Professor Birkin uh, uh, shows how they wrestle in the 1790s to try to create a new republic under our Constitution. And so walks us through these amazing episodes like the Whiskey Rebellion, the XYZ Affair, uh, the, the controversy over the Alien and Sedition Acts. But you can get a sense of both the rise of, of early American politics, uh, but also the way in which these people who had so many divisions tried to come together um, and build a single American project together. So we're going we're gonna to discuss uh, uh, that here, but, but, but please do pick up the book downstairs and there'll be a signing after the show. Uh, but first, a little business, just want to plug a few of our upcoming programs. Um, on June 8th, uh, the evening of June 8th, we're going to have a film screening of the HBO documentary, The Loving Story, which is a celebration of the 50th anniversary of Loving, Loving v. Virginia, uh, which uh, struck down state bans on interracial marriage. And you, know, we'll, you, you will get popcorn and concessions uh, with, with your ticket to that. Uh, we'll also have a cash bar, so it should be a wonderful constitutional evening. Uh, so, so please join us for that. Um, also next month, you know, we're, we're going to be tackling the future of Congress with leading scholars and reporters. It should be a great conversation uh, with our President Jeff Rosen. Uh, and then we're go we'll also have programs on George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, so both uh, a hero of the first founding and a hero of America's second founding. So great programming coming up. If you want to check out the full schedule, we have them outside the hard copies, or check it out on constitutioncenter.org slash debate. Um, but now just to give a, 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 a formal welcome here for uh, Professor Birkin. Carol Birkin is the Presidential Professor of History Emerita at the City University of New York Graduate Center and Baruch College. She's the author of many acclaimed books and is here today again to discuss her new book, A Sovereign People, The Crises of the 1790s and the Birth of American Nationalism. Again, book sale and signing downstairs after this. But please join me in welcoming Carol Birkin. Thank you so much. Sure. So this is, again, as, as, I, as I said in my introduction, and I mean it sincerely, uh, just a, a terrific book, terrific, uh, terrific read. I learned so much about this period in history. Um, I'd like to begin where you do in the book, which is with the image of an anxious George Washington taking over the presidency. Can you talk a little bit about uh, where we were as a people in 1789 and what George Washington and his colleagues were concerned about down the road? Well, we weren't yet actually a people. We were Marylanders and Georgians and New Yorkers and Connecticut people. Uh, there was not yet really a sense of a unified nation. Uh, men like Washington and Hamilton and at the time Madison wrote the Constitution in part to try to forge a national identity to, and in fact to take away some of the power the states had, which was all of the power at the time, and transfer that to a we the people government. Uh, there had been extraordinary opposition to this, as some of you may know. Uh, the anti-federalists were probably, probably outnumbered the federalists, that is the people who supported the Constitution, uh, and uh, only great good luck in many of the conventions got the Constitution passed. Washington knew all of this. Hamilton certainly knew all of this. When the first government came into being, that is when Washington's first administration began, Washington, most of these men, feared that it would be an abysmal failure. They feared, first of all, they thought all republics eventually became tyrannies. They looked to Rome and other places. Uh, ben Franklin had once said, if this Constitution preserves a republic for 10 years, we will have done our duty. 
So uh, Washington starts not knowing that in the future he would be lauded as the first of 40-something presidents. They knew that still most Americans were suspicious of a central government, preferred their state government, their local government to be in charge, especially of taxation. Uh, and Washington understood that he was on trial. And being keenly aware of both his abilities and his areas where he was somewhat naive, he said, basically, I have experience as a general, but I don't have a lot of administrative experience. And his inaugural, which everyone really should read, is a monument to modesty. Here he was the most admired man in America, and it's a very modest statement, uh, a hopeful statement that he can guide the country into this remarkable experiment. Now, one word you use in, in your subtitle is, is the word nationalism, which, which can often have a loaded meaning. Uh, wh what do you mean by it in, in, in your title here and in the context of the 1790s? It is the effort to produce something called an American identity. It is an effort to, on their part, the Federalists, to try to win the loyalty of the American citizens uh, to the federal government. Uh, the Federalists, I want to say, have always gotten a bad rap. People are very fond of Thomas Jefferson, especially historians. Historians like Jefferson because he reminds them of their professorial style. <laughs> Mull over, debate, discuss, don't do anything, let's talk about it in the next meeting. Gee, I wonder about the ambiguities. And they hate Hamilton because Hamilton was always saying, OK, what's the plan? What are we going to do? How do we turn this into a project? Uh, the Federalists. Most historians, I must say, have accepted Jefferson's view of the Federalists, which is that they were trying to create, uh, uh, reproduce the English monarchy here. He called them monocrats, that they were monocrats, that they were elitist, that they didn't uh, trust the people. I happen to think that there's another view. And so the <laughs> nationalism, in, in a way, as a look at the way in which these much maligned Federalists actually saved the Constitution and saved, set the country on its path. They made lots and lots of mistakes. Nevertheless, when Jefferson took over in 1801, American nationalism, that is a sense of an American identity, an absolute acceptance that the Constitution was the law of the land had, had been instituted. So three cheers for the Federalists. They weren't so bad after all. <laughs> well, I'd like to, to turn first here to uh, the first episode, episode you talk about, which is, is the Whiskey Rebellion. And you write there that no matter how historians and their readers judge the Whiskey Rebels or the government that defeated them, it is important to realize that President George Washington and his allies had good reason to believe these Westerners posed a serious threat to the survival of the federal government. So broadly speaking, you know, what was the Whiskey Rebellion and what were the, the, the stakes of this episode for the early republic? After 40 years of teaching, I can assure, I started when I was 12, I can, <laughs> I can assure you Many of my students think, OK, the Constitution's written, it's passed, and then everything is fine. <clears throat> it wasn't that way. The whiskey rebels were really quite dangerous because in a, they were Western Pennsylvanians from Westmoreland County and Allegheny County and uh, 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 Americans who lived in what would become Kentucky in Western Virginia. And they produced. Uh, whiskey out of the grains that they grew because the Mississippi River was uh, forbidden to them by the Spanish who controlled Louisiana. And so they couldn't ship their grains down the river quickly to get them to market. 
and there were no highways and <laughs> no cars and no buses and no, no planes. And so on muleback, they had to travel hundreds of miles to get to Philadelphia or even to Pittsburgh to market their grain. By the time they got there, it was no good. So being clever people, they transformed it into alcohol, which only got better and better the longer it took to get it to market. <laughs> Alexander Hamilton passes uh, an excise tax on, on distilled liquor and on rum and on imported wines because the American government owed potloads of money to everyone. They owed money to France, they owed money to Holland, they owed money to Spain, they owed money to the soldiers, they owed money to the officers in the army, they owed money to all the citizens who'd given the military cows and chickens and supplies. They owed money to everybody. And so he couldn't, um, he funded the debt and he couldn't make the payments based just on import duties. So he, passed a, he got Congress to pass an excise tax on something that everybody figured, not everybody was engaged in this activity of producing alcohol, and anyway, everybody in America drank way too much, which is really true. Uh, in the 18th century, you would be appalled to know men, women, and children <laughs> drank a lot. And so Hamilton said, look, this is good for our moral fiber. This is good for our country. Well, the whiskey producers didn't agree. And they said, basically, you'll pardon my French, who the hell are you, this federal government? We don't have to obey your laws. Go away. And when they sent the revenue collectors out, vigilantes beat them up and burned down their homes and basically just uh, made it impossible for the tax to be collected. Even worse, in what became Kentucky, they didn't even bother to protest. They just said, we're just ignoring this. We're and the local lawyers and the governor and, <laughs> and all the officials ignored the federal government completely. So in one part, in Pennsylvania, you have people burning down homes and threatening people and forcing people to sign loyalty oaths, making a revolution, in effect. And in another part, you have people going, go away, don't bother me. Well, obviously, if these people got away with this, what would happen the next time a law was passed a group of people didn't like? They would say, no, not doing that, sorry. Go away. And what power would the federal, what authority would the federal government have? Hamilton wanted to send an army in right away. He said, we have to protect our federal officers, that is the revenue collectors, and we have to enforce a congressional law. Washington is more politic than Hamilton. He said, nah, if we send an army in, to suppress this insurrection, we will be confirming all the great fears of people who are opposed to the federal government that it's a tyranny. So we have to dot all our I's and cross all our T's, and we have to try them in courts. We have to send a commission to kind of negotiate, try to negotiate with them. We have to warn them. And it took really almost two years before finally Washington said, I can issue a proclamation that says we have tried everything peaceable and now we're sending in a militia army. Not a single person really ever served a jail term. Everybody was given amnesty. Nobody was cruelly beaten or destroyed, but the power, the authority of the federal government was upheld. And if Washington hadn't done this, uh, we would either be singing the Marseillaise today or we would be hailing Britannica, Britannia, Britannia, <laughs> or who knows what we would be. And how, how important was it that, uh, so part of the story is sort of the, 
uh, the temperament and wisdom of Washington in yes. proceeding the way he did. How much, how, how important was it too that just him being the, the head of the government and, and the goodwill he just built yes. up versus someone else being in that yes. position? I will tell you, sometimes hi historians don't know what they're really writing about till they're done. And I realized, I thought I was just writing about these four crises in the 1790s and the way in which the Federalists handled them. And then I realized, when I had written about the Whiskey Rebels, that what I was really writing about was the rise of this national identity. The first crises, Americans accepted what the federal government did solely because Washington was the head of the government. He was beloved. They weren't really making a statement when they sent letters applauding what, it, what the government had done. They weren't really talking about the government. They were saying, whatever you do, George Washington, we're behind you all the way. And so that was the first way in which people, Americans at the time, thought about the federal government. It was really Washington's, Washington's domain in the, in the preceding crises, you can watch American, the American voting public move to a respect for what the federal government is capable of doing, to a sense that they had a national identity when other nations uh, demeaned them and, and cheated them and attacked them. And finally, to even the opponents of the Federalists, Jefferson and Madison, admitting that they too support the Constitution, that the issue is no longer should we have a federal government or shouldn't we have a federal government. It's what kind of federal government should we have. And so that, that progression seems to me in the course of 10 years to be really quite remarkable. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let, let, let's turn to the, the second crisis here and the controversy <laughs> around uh, Citizen Genet. And here you say that Citizen Genet, as he called himself, would pose a foreign challenge to America's federal government as disturbing as the domestic rebellion in Western Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. uh, those, are, those are big words. What, what do you mean by that? And who was Citizen Genet? Citizen Genet was a lot of fun. <laughs> he was about 25 years old. It's hard to realize that both the ambassador from Great Britain and the ambassador from France hadn't turned 30 yet. They were young. Tells you something about Europeans' notions of the importance of America at the time. Uh, again, my students all think, as one student put it, from the minute the pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock, on it, mind you, not near it, but on it, America became the most important country in the world. Fortunately, he was an accounting major. <laughs> Genet comes over, basically. Uh, the French Revolution has taken place, and the Girondists are in power, and they are proselytizers of, of uh, liberty, fraternity, equality. And they're proselytizing it by conquering every neighboring country in France. I mean, they are imperialists carrying the banner of freedom and liberty and, and with guns. Uh, and they want to seize Spanish-held Louisiana, and they want to seize British-held Canada. And they want to fight the English on the ocean. So they decide without consulting with America, that they will make the United States a satellite of France, that they will come over and set up their own admiralty courts in American ports. Forget the fact that Americans had an admiralty court. We're setting up our own. They would recruit Americans to serve on privateers that they would outfit in American ports. They would bring the prizes, the English ships, that into American ports and sell them, regardless of the fact that Washington had issued a proclamation of neutrality in the European War. And France said, I mean, you know, that's a mere detail. They recruited, again from Kentucky, Kentucky's got a bad rep in this book, they recruited 
soldiers to fight in the French army to attack Spanish Florida. So in other words, American sovereignty didn't exist. American foreign policy didn't exist. They were going to recolonize the United States making America a satellite of the French government. And they send over this young, impetuous uh, Edmund Genet, who had charisma and was really a fast talker, but who had not bothered to learn anything about how the American government worked. It was his assumption that the president didn't matter, that the only person, group that mattered was the House of Representatives. And so when Washington and Jefferson as his Secretary of State uh, tried to explain to him that he couldn't do certain things because the president had a neutral neutrality po uh, policy, Genet just said, oh, well, that's just his opinion. I, you know, <laughs> what do I care what his opinion is? What's wonderful about Genet is he writes the most bombastic, absurd letters. Uh, I have 98 of them, and we know there were more. And he was only here operating as, as the Minister of France for nine months, so he managed to get a lot of them out. With, with all this rhetoric about we are sisters in the revolution, we shed our blood for you during your revolution, you must shed your blood for us now. Just uh, as I'm sitting at my computer laughing, which really historians don't get to do a lot. <laughs> Again, Washington is very smart. He says to Jefferson, you've got to deal with this man. You've got to explain to him. And when absolutely nothing works, Jefferson, who's an enormous supporter of the French Revolution, even after thousands of people are being executed, he's all for the French Revolution. Jefferson tries to explain over and over again to Genet, you're not really helping your cause by sending letters saying that the president basically is an idiot and really doesn't go over that well with the administration. And finally, even Jefferson says, I wash my hands of him. He's hopeless. And Washington and his cabinet call for Genet's recall. Now, what's interesting is, I think, the clincher to this, is that in between when uh, Genet comes over, and when the recall is called for, the French government has turned over. And Robespierre and people who are not at all interested in spreading liberty, equality, and, and fraternity, but are simply interested in defeating England, come into power. And they decide that Genet is a traitor, along with all the Girondists who were in the former government. And they say to Washington, I want him arrested and sent back to France. And you know what's going to happen to him. And Washington says no. Washington said when he was minister, he was an irritant and a danger. But now he's just a young man. And he gave him political refuge in America. He married Governor Clinton's daughter and lived as a country gentleman in New York and became an American citizen. <laughs> so y you can see Washington at his best. I'll fight him when he's a danger, and I won't be vindictive, just as he did with the Whiskey Rebels. Uh, I'll defeat them when they're a challenge to the government, but I'll grant them amnesty when it's all over. So. Uh, Genet disappears from, from, uh, as a challenge. The French government never gives up, by the way, through the entire decade trying to manipulate America. Think Russia today. Uh, the French government really wanted to seize control of American policy. 
That's interesting. And let's, let's, let's fast forward past George Washington <laughs> and into the Adams administration. Um, the next episode you talk about is the XYZ affair when you characterize uh, Adams's choices here as uh, an impossible choice between ruinous peace and ruinous war. Uh, what did you mean by that? And, and, and talk a little bit about this episode. Adams, bless his heart. I, I, I really love Adams. He was probably bipolar. I mean, really, he had days of great sense of his own importance, and then days when he would write in his journal, I am just a lowly worm. Uh, he, he, he was not a good politician. He comes into office, and instead of choosing a cabinet of people who might be loyal to him, he keeps on the cabinet that Washington had, that are, is basically loyal to Washington and Hamilton. Hamilton and, and Adams become bitter enemies. He doesn't understand building party loyalty. He, he, he has this picture of himself as the philosopher king, and he just makes error after error after error. Uh, he means well. I mean, Adams means well, but he's not cut out to be president. So he sends. France has started attacking American ships and capturing them and taking the cargo from the ships. In other words, making money off American shipping. And Adams decides to do just what, what Washington had done with Great Britain. When Great Britain starts stepping up its naval war against America, he sends John Jay over and they sign a, sign a commercial treaty. So Adams says, OK, I'll do the same thing with France. And he sends over three men who have no diplomatic experience, who have no idea how to do what they're assigned to do, one of whom is the most hated man in American politics, Elbridge Gerry, who cannot get along with anyone. He's from Massachusetts. One of the cabinet members says to Adams, well, if you want to ensure that this mission will fail, you've picked the right man. <laughs> right. Three men who had to cooperate. Elbridge Gerry has not racked up a single cooperative moment in his entire career. Someone, someone else, there's a wonderful quote, says, uh, the only time Elbridge Ger Gary agrees with anything is when he has proposed it himself. John Marshall, who was going to rise to be a very uh, prestigious jurist, had no experience outside of Virginia. I'm not even sure he'd ever left Virginia physically, uh, traveled. And Charles Pinckney, who was a little light on intelligence, but quite an a honorable gentleman. And these three men go over to negotiate with who of all people? Talleyrand, the slyest, most unprincipled, <laughs> avaricious person in politics in the 18th century. And he just runs circles around them. He, I, it, it's painful to read. You can read it all in the papers of John Marshall, because Marshall sends back all the, the uh, reports to Adams. First thing Talleyrand does is he says, I can't negotiate with you until your president apologizes for something he said in a speech in May that offended our government. And also, you must give France a forced loan. And also, you have to give me a big bribe. I'm not going to deal with you till you do that. And he sends unofficial representatives to deal with them, who we have come to know as X, Y, and Z. They're not government officials. They have no authority, no portfolio. And instead of saying, we're envoys of the United States government, we will not deal with anyone who is not an official member of the government, they sit down with these fellas. And these long discussions take place about you have to pay a bribe. You have to pay a bribe. We don't want to pay a bribe. No, you have to pay a bribe. You have to give France a loan. It goes on for 
eight, nine months, and then not once have they been officially recognized. Elbridge Gary decides that if they don't give in to everything the French government wants, then France will declare war on America and all will be lost. And he starts secretly meeting the Talleyrand. If you know anything about diplomatic activity, that's a big mistake. Finally, they all come home. Nothing has been accomplished. And Adams is forced to make war preparations. He doesn't think France will invade America because he, they're busy fighting England, but he can't take the risk. More taxes are imposed. He creates a huge army. They create a navy, but Adams refuses to declare war. It goes on for several months, and what happens? The American people, who've been all excited, you know, getting ready for war, no war happens. So they begin to say, I don't want to pay those taxes to support the army anymore. I don't want to. And, and Adams's career is over. He either had to declare war or not, uh, openly say, I'm not going to declare war, and he does nothing. And his, his political career is finished. The, the, the comedy is in reading, I know it shouldn't be a comedy, but the comedy is in reading Elbridge Gerry arguing with Charles Pinckney and, and uh, John Marshall. It's Charles Pinckney who makes the comment, not one cent for tribute. The outcome of this is not disaster in the long run. The outcome of this is Republicans and Federalists alike rise to the defense of American, the American federal government and American sovereignty. They rise to the idea that we are a people united against foreign countries. And it's really the, the priceless moment in American, the birth of this American nationalism. Uh, it's a remarkable moment of unity when people in Georgia and people in Massachusetts and people in Philadelphia and pro-Adams people and anti-Adams people come together and say, uh, you cannot divide us. Because the French have said, well, we'll just go in and we'll appeal to the anti-federalist group. We'll appeal to the Jeffersonians, and they'll take over the government. And the Jeffersonians say, absolutely not. We are all Americans. And that's really an extraordinary moment for, for the survival of the American, American government. Now, coincidentally, we're, we're opening a new exhibit next week on John Marshall and his, his life and legacy. And we'll actually have the, his traveling de desk from the XYZ affair oh, as, part no of, as part of the exhibit. I, I'm just curious. So he's obviously, as you say, inexperienced during this, uh, this episode. Uh, but do we see any, any early indications of either his character or, or vision or judgment in yes, this affair? Yes, absolutely. You see his intelligence. He figures out very early on that they're being played. I mean, he figures, figures it out early. And he says, look, we can't meet with, they don't call them X, Y, and Z. The men have names. It's, it's Adams who calls them that in his report on what the commission has done, because the, Ameri the three envoys are still in France, and he's afraid if he names these people, the French government will arrest uh, uh, Marshal uh, uh, Gary and, and uh, uh, Pinckney. So he says, we can't meet with them anymore. This is beneath the dignity of our country. So he has a firm nationalism already. He has a very astute political sense. What he doesn't have is two men who are working with him who will follow his lead. And you can f fault him, as I do in the book, rather gingerly, that he doesn't, he doesn't stand up to Gary. Gary is his senior, both in years and in position. 
He's a representative. He was at the Constitutional Convention. And, and Marshall is loath to uh, uh, really uh, stand up to Gary. Later on, of course, uh, his backbone becomes quite strong when he becomes a jurist. When he's a, uh, Jefferson, by the way, hated Marshall. They were distant cousins, and, and they hated each other. And Jefferson referred to him, disliked his lounging manner. Uh, John Marshall was very handsome, had a thick head of black hair, and he was tall and handsome. But he dressed rather casually. He dressed as sort of in J. Crew style instead of Brooks Brothers style. <laughs> and he would often, you know, lounge. And Jefferson, for some reason, just found this horrific. And uh, Marshall responded by saying, and you can't believe anything that comes out of Thomas Jefferson's mouth. So <laughs> for their entire life, they, were very, they, they did not spend Thanksgiving together. <laughs> so let, let, let's turn uh, to, to your final episode here, which has to do with the Alien and Sedition Acts. Uh, can you just talk briefly about what those acts did? And, then, and furthermore, why, why the Federalists thought that they were necessary? Yeah. Uh, if you read the Alien and Sedition Acts and you read the modern newspaper, you will see uh, extraordinary parallels, though, of course, the 18th century and the 21st century are not the same. The Federalists were really afraid that the Jeffersonian party, which was gaining power, uh, would dismantle the, the federal government, that it, they would uh, get rid of the Bank of the United States and cause financial disaster, that they would uh, return an enormous amount of power to the states and all the work that the federal government had done to create a national identity would fall apart. And they were really running scared after Adams's disastrous negotiations. Uh, and so they said, while we're riding high uh, on, on Americans' uh, hostility to France and American sense of unity, let's try to destroy the, the Jeffersonian party. Uh, I, I certainly don't defend this behavior. I'm only saying that if you cast your mind back to the 18th century, they really, really believed that the Constitution and the federal government was endangered by the Republicans, uh, who are not the Republicans today. They, were the, they eventually became the Democratic Party, but they were the Jeffersonian Republicans. Very worried about what would happen to the Constitution. Jefferson had written a 20-page attack on the Constitution when it was originally proposed. They were great states' rights advocates. They wanted a lot of these powers given back to the states. And so they, the Federalists, while they thought they were riding high with American populist support, passed a series of laws. The, the naturalization law extended the time dramatically that it took to become an American citizen if you immigrated to America from, from four years to 14 years. The Alien Acts, one was the Alien Friends Act, which said that if you seem to be trying to overthrow the American government, even if we weren't at war with your country, the president could send you out of the country. The Alien Enemies Act said, if we're at war with your country, he thought maybe we'd be at war with France, and you come over here and cause trouble, we can send you back to your country. These, uh, those two laws, the Alien Acts, were never acted upon by Adams, ever. The Alien Enemies Act is not acted on until the 20th century. Uh, the last of the acts, which is the really, the clinker, the clincher, is the Sedition Act that basically was designed to silence the Republican newspapers. And people, historians, get very worked up about this, and I understand why. But if you look at what happened, 14 people were indicted. Seven of them ever went to trial. Four of them were convicted. It's not 
there was not some wholesale repression going on. And why were so few people arrested and convicted? Because the Federalists believed in the rule of law. They brought them to court. They didn't imprison them unfairly. They did. And while these newspaper editors were in jail, they were allowed to continue to publish uh, uh, scandalous statements about the Federalist government. They were allowed to keep right on publishing the newspaper, publishing their articles. I'm really not excusing the Federalists, but the idea that they were some behemoth, uh, repressive force that crushed the life out of free, the free press is simply not true. They were, they were too inept to do that, in part, but also they really believed that you should have a federal jury indict you, that you should be able to get out on bail. That they wanted to follow all the legal rules that had been established in, in the American government and in the Bill of Rights. And so basically they failed utterly. In, in Jefferson won the election in 1801. The Republican press thrived. The Jeffersonian party spread into the North right into the Federalist strongholds, and the Federalist Party was dead by 1814. So they may have tried to be tyrannical, but they were really pretty bad at it. <laughs> <laughs> and then you also talk about the, uh, the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions yes. and, and, and the, the constitutional arguments brought forth by right. the Republicans, and now right. this exposes right. the, 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 the two constitutional visions. Can you talk a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, that's what was really important. The repression was really a dud. What is important is that Thomas Jefferson secretly wrote for Kentucky, and James Madison secretly wrote for Virginia a set of resolutions uh, in opposition to the Alien and Sedition Acts. Both of them, Kentucky even more than Virginia, suggested the right of nullification. That is, they were ringing statements of state sovereignty. The two, the Virginia and Kentucky resolves both said that the Constitution had been created by the states and that if the states didn't like a law that was passed, they had the right to declare it null and void. You will recognize, if you're a student of the American Civil War, that this is the argument that, of course, Jefferson Davis and others used for secession. Uh, Jefferson hinted at the right to secede in the Kentucky resolutions. Uh, the idea that not we the people, but the, the states created the federal government and retained sovereignty over it was what was in these sets of resolutions. They invited other states to join them, and not a single other state agreed to this theory about how the federal government came into being. Uh, and so these uh, Virginia and Kentucky failed in what they were trying to do. What is really sad is that it introduced the idea of nullification into the American political vocabulary. What's important about it, however, is that they were arguing about how to interpret the Constitution. And in that sense, they were agreeing to the legitimacy of the Constitution. And so anti-federalism died the day that those Virginia and Kentucky resolutions came out. In an odd way, it was a victory for the Federalists, even though their interpretation of the Constitution was challenged. And so you see in this 10-year period, this arc from admiration of George Washington to acceptance that the executive branch controlled foreign policy, controlled diplomacy, and that was a good idea to an idea that we are all Americans, to an idea that yes, the Constitution is the frame of government for everybody in every state in this 
union. And when I was done writing the book, I went, <laughs> not I should have had a V8, I went, <laughs> I went, this is really a book about the rise of a positive American nationalism. It's not just about how crises arose and how the Federalists dealt with them. And so the, the subtitle uh, uh, reflects that, that realization on my part. Yeah, and, and I mean, one of the, it, it, the, the backdrop of almost the entire narrative is also, you know, the, it, it, there's the rise of nationalism. There's also the, the, the sort of the rapid emergence of political divisions and yeah. the political parties. You know, we, we have, you know, Washington in, in 1789 at the beginning of the book. How, how quickly do the Jeffersonians arise and, and, and does that uh, two-party nature? Uh, almost immediately. It, it arises, it, the anti-federalists are still there during Washington's first administration. They're in state governments, like Patrick Henry, uh, they're in state government saying, we don't accept the Constitution at all. We want to alter it so that it is really just a league of friendship, the way the Articles of Confederation were. Then Hamilton comes along with his economic program and fiscal program, which takes an enormous amount, ultimately, of power away from the states. And Jefferson says, this is a sign that they want to be Great Britain. This is a sign that they're a, that he also calls it an allomancy, as in support of Anglo, Ameri uh, Anglo policies, uh, English policies. And he forms, the party is really pretty well formed by the end of uh, uh, Washington's first administration. It's really quite quick. And I, I want to add just as a, Without political parties, actually, it, the federal government never would have worked because the checks and balances were so extreme that no piece of legislation probably could have gotten through without, without parties to, see, to join the House with the Senate with the presidency. Without that, there would be a deadlock constantly. So though many of us in the field regret the rise of the party system in the uh, 18th century, probably it's what allowed the government to actually function. Excellent. Let, yeah. Let's turn to some of the audience questions. Thank you so much for, for, for writing these down. Uh, let's see, Adams was a poor diplomat in Europe during the Revolutionary War. Did he not learn anything between then and his appointment of <laughs> Gary Pinckney and Marshall? <laughs> Apparently not. Uh, he had this vision that comes out of the Revolution of the Republican leader, meaning the leader of the Republic, and they were to be above party, disinterested, uh, not personally going to gain from anything. And really, it was a kind of philosophical position, which is very nice to have when you're writing. But it's really not very effective when you're president. And his appointment of these three men, one of my favorite lines in the book is he was sending sheep to deal with the wolves. <laughs> and that's really, really what happened. Uh, Excellent. Uh, you stated at the outset that the 1790s turned Pennsylvanians, Virginians, et cetera, into Americans. Didn't this process begin in the 1760s and simply continue into the 1790s? I don't think so. Uh, if you read, for instance, the journals of the soldiers, and there are really almost 100 of them that were put out by the New York Times book um, publishing press uh, in the tw early 20th century. These soldiers, on the whole, identified with their state. In fact, there's a wonderful journal of uh, uh, Joseph Plum Martin, which has been published as Ordinary Courage. He's from Massachusetts, and when he arrives in Pennsylvania with the Continental Army, he writes, I just met some Pennsylvanians. They look just like us. <laughs> uh, I it's perfectly understandable that people were provincial. The great revolutions in transportation and communication lay in the 19th century. 
If you lived in Georgia, Massachusetts may as well have been on the moon. If you were a farmer in, in western Pennsylvania, it's not like you picked up the Washington Post the next, or you tuned in to Fox News or MSNBC. If you lived in South Carolina, even throughout the end of the 18th century, the news you got arrived with ship captains from England, and it was English news. You didn't have your own local newspaper. Uh, you didn't know what was happening. And this is one reason why so many people were anti-federalists. They said, if you create a national government and you put it in New York City, it may as well be in London. It may, it, it's not us. It's not. It, they don't, people in New York don't under, people still say this, by the way. <laughs> I know, I live in New York. People in New York don't understand what people in Georgia need. So there was an enormous provincialism, an enormous localism, that as soon as the war was over, states went back to vine with one another. I'm very fond of pointing out that Virginia and Maryland had gunboats on the Potomac aimed at one another to prevent any smuggling going on without paying import taxes from one of these states to another. So I, I would really argue that there was not a real sense of being Americans until the end of the century. Excellent. Uh, what is a Jeffersonian versus Hamiltonian vision vis-a-vis -vis federalism? <laughs> this would take did, would, did you all bring sleeping bags? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Hamilton was a nation builder. I, I want to say right up front, I'm a great fan of Alexander Hamilton's. Uh, he was a nation builder. He wasn't in it for himself. There was not a moment when Hamilton thought, I can't get rich off this. He was an incredible lawyer. He could have been much richer if he'd stayed home in New York and practiced law. He didn't embezzle any funds. He didn't take advantage of inside trading. All he wanted to do was build a country that could challenge Great Britain for dominance in the Western world. And he had a plan. And that pl plan was funding the debts, absorbing the state debts, building a bank, creating a bank. He, he was a phenomenal visionary and really one of the few of the framers and founders who really was a visionary. In 1782, before we had won the revolution, he writes out a plan for how to make America competitive with Great Britain. I mean, this is a man always looking to the future. Jefferson was an agrarian romantic, I think. Jefferson really liked the life that he led. And he wanted America to remain a farming um, country. Not that Jefferson ever personally farmed. He wrote great paeans to the fact that unless you had produced your wealth from the soil, you had not produced real wealth. Well, he had 300 slaves who were doing that for him, not to be you know, cute about it. But he did envision what he considered to be a stable agrarian world. And so everything that Hamilton did uh, offended him, scared him, worried him. Uh, Jefferson hated cities. He thought that they were sin pots and places where uh, uh, people uh, uh, were only after money. He especially hated New York City. Uh, Hamilton thought like some of the medieval men who said, city air breathes free. City air lets you be free. You can, it's, it's what you could make of yourself. It's not who your father was. And that mattered a lot to Hamilton, because after all, he was a bastard. Uh, I mean, he was an illegitimate child. And so who his daddy was was not really going to get him very far. Jefferson is part of that Virginia, I know my lineage, 
uh, if, if you are a Virginian, you know, I mean, the first families of Virginia, the fine families of Virginia, Jefferson was part of a kind of stable hierarchy. And so they were destined, I, I think, to clash. If you had really a lot more time, we could talk about each program. You know, historians have no life. This is what we do. <laughs> I have a friend who once said, the reason I write so many books is I never learned to dance. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I could go on and on and on about this. But basically, they had very different visions for the country. Jefferson wanted states to retain most of the power to make laws for the people in the state. He didn't trust centralized power. And he did not want America to become a commercial and manufacturing uh, world. Jefferson's support for popular participation is successful in American history. Hamilton's support for a trajectory of liberal capitalism won in America. And so the irony is, Though they opposed one another, in the end, they became the two leading identif identifiers of, of America, right? That's excellent. Probably have time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, what can we learn from this history? It's, some of it seems obvious, but if you can elaborate a few lessons. <laughs> uh, again, a pretty complicated question. <laughs> I think people cannot understand what they should do next until they understand how they got where they are. History is important not because it has little lessons uh, that you can pick up and apply. History never repeats itself. The context in which something happens is always different. And if it not, is not, your country has stagnated and died. But history tells you how we got where we are. Uh, we live in an era where states' rights versus federal power is a lively issue. We have to understand how it originated and why it originated and why it's different now than it was then. So I think the 1790s, which is really an era of how the government deals with crises, how American nationalism came to be, and not the nationalism of nativism, not the nationalism of this is our country and nobody else can come here. That's a completely different kind of nationalism. So distinguishing those nationalisms, I think, is really important. Uh, and so knowing, knowing your past, knowing the childhood of the country, I think helps you understand it in its mature moments. I can't make you un believe that, but I can urge you to believe that. Well, I think that's a, that's a great note to end <laughs> on. You, you should definitely learn from it from this book, A Sovereign People. Please give Thank the National Constitution Thank Center. You. Thank you to Carol Birkin. Thank you. Great questions. Great Thank you so questions. much. This is, this sure. is really terrific.